Lord God, this morning as I watched the sunrise from uh, our room getting ready, I was reminded that your steadfast love never ceases. Your mercies never come to an end. That they are new every morning. And great is your faithfulness. And Lord, I thank you for that this morning. I pray that each one of us would remember in our hearts the ways in which your love and mercy have followed us wherever we have gone. And Lord, we pray this morning for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. Lord, we pray for the war that is continuing to rage on. We pray for it to come to an end. We pray for peace. And we pray for freedom for the people of Ukraine. And Lord, as those, uh, as, as there are men and uh, women and children who are fleeing the country, Lord, we pray for safe passage for them. We pray for safety and provision and protection for them as they flee these war-torn areas. We pray for the refugees who have already left for those who are in an unfamiliar place, many alone, without support. Father, I pray for, for them, Lord, that they would not lose heart, that they would continue to trust in you, those that do, and those that have not trusted in you, Lord, that you would bring them to a saving knowledge of you, of your son, Jesus. Lord, we pray for the countries that are taking in refugees, Father, we pray that you would uh, embolden and encourage their leaders to, to treat them with justice and grace as they help, help them resettle into new areas. We pray especially for protection uh, and provision for the leaders of Ukraine and for those who are continuing to fight to preserve their freedom. Lord, we pray that you would give them victory, that you would give them success and that you would bring an end to this war swiftly. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading uh, this morning comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. If you would turn with me to Mark chapter 10. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud and honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. And truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will, fall, will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the word of the Lord. One of my favorite authors for 
just kind of devotional reading is Max Lucado. And I've always appreciated Max Lucado's perspective, especially on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's written some outstanding books about that. In one of those books, there is a statement that I've used in a number of sermons over the years, which I believe with all my heart. If there are a thousand steps between us and God, he will take all but one. He will leave the final step for us. The choice is ours. Hear that again. If there are a thousand steps between us and God, he will take all but one. He will leave the final one for us, and the choice is ours. I believe this is the best and most accurate way to describe the story that was just read for us by Pastor Kevin from Mark 10. It's a story about a man who was but one step away from a personal and eternal relationship with God. Now, Mark doesn't tell us very much about this man, and, and actually, nor does Matthew or Luke. They have the same story that they recall. But calling together what little personal information the Gospels do reveal, we have dubbed this man the rich young ruler, and that's how we know him. And if you know anything about Scripture, you know the story of the rich young ruler. But what's interesting is that despite his youth, despite his wealth, despite his power, all of those things are very important to the culture. Listen, if you're going to get ahead, you better be young, you better have money, you better have power. Despite all of those things, did you notice that there was something missing in this man's life? And he knew it. There was an emptiness inside of him that he was keenly aware of. And so the story opens with this man coming to Jesus, literally running to him, falling on his knees and saying, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I've I, I heard that you can know, that you, that you can know with confidence that you have eternal life. I, I heard that. But what must I do, good teacher, to inherit eternal life? Now, listen, to call a rabbi good teacher is without parallel in the Hebrew culture of Jesus' day. Only God was ascribed as good in early Judaism. So when this man ran to Jesus and fell on his knees and called him good, something was happening here, and most likely it was a lot of flattery, kind of, I want to get on the good side of this new and great teacher, this rabbi that's making the rounds. But what this young man didn't realize is that the teacher named Jesus was indeed good because he was truly God. Jesus intentionally begins his reply with some thought-provoking words with this young guy. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. It's sort of like saying, do you realize who you're talking to? Do you know who I am, that, that I really am the good teacher because I really am God? Having prodded the young man with them thinking in this comment, Jesus then addresses his very sincere question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, what I want you to notice in the scripture this morning is that his answer has two parts. The first part is almost like a pop quiz on the Ten Commandments, or at least six of the Ten Commandments. The commandments are considered the gold standard of law for the Jews. And and it's believed, according to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 16, that if you keep the Ten Commandments, then you have life. And so what Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, teacher, the guy says. All these I've kept since I was a boy. Now, when you read that response, you can kind of take a step back and say, man, you're arrogant. I mean, how can you say that you're sinless, that you've done everything perfectly, that you've kept these commandments? But I don't think this man was claiming sinlessness. I think he was claiming faithfulness. And I think that he believed with all his heart, and it may be very true in terms of the letter of law, he never murdered anyone. He hadn't committed adultery. He didn't steal, lie, or defraud. He's honored his parents, now you'd have to ask the parents to know whether that really is the case, but you know, as his perspective, I've honored my parents. This young man is really rightly claiming to Jesus, I'm not a bad man. 
I, I've, I've done my best here. I, I, think I, I think I can check off every one of the boxes on the six commandments that you've given. But that's just the first part of Jesus' answer. And it turns out it was the easiest part because what Jesus says next, frankly, it's a tough one. It's unexpected, it's unyielding. It catches the man off guard completely. But hear me when I say this. What he says next, which is really a hard saying for this man, is completely bathed in love. One of the most beautiful verses in this entire story is verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. I just want to camp out there for a minute and just, I just want you to realize this. It's what he does for every one of us. You know that. You realize that this guy that he's talking to is not where Jesus wants him to be. He is not a worshiper of the one true and living God. He is camped out on his money, his power, his youth. But I want you to see something here. In spite of all of that, the word of God says Jesus looked at him and loved him. Don't you ever doubt the love of Jesus for you. Don't you ever doubt that. No matter where you are in life, no matter how far you may fall in life, the truth of God's word is that Jesus looks at us and he loves us. And you know what this love is? It is agape love. It is unconditional love. It is a love that has no reservation. It has no condition to it. This man loved, Jesus loved this man for who he was. He loved him for who he would become. He loved him because he knew that this man had one final step, just one. And that's what he needed to take, that one final step. And he would come into a personal living relationship with the God of the universe. He would experience salvation, the forgiveness of sin, a new and eternal life. One thing you lack, Jesus says. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. There are some folks who, who know just enough about the Bible. I had one of them in my congregation who actually visited my church one time in Baltimore, and he said, hey, I know all about the Bible. In order to follow Jesus, you have to sell everything you have, and that's the only way you can follow him. I know what this says. Man, hold on to your seats right now. Because this is not a capital campaign sermon today, okay? I'm not going to reach into your wallet. There is something of greater consequence than even that. One thing you lack, Jesus said, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. There is only one thing that stands between this rich young ruler and a new life in Jesus Christ. And that one thing is not money. Friends, that one thing, that one step is called surrender. It's called surrender. Now let me tell you, in this specific incidence, yes, it is the surrender of his money, which had come between him and Jesus. For this rich young ruler, what he had, wealth, had become his savior, the center of his life. He was trusting his riches to give him real life. He was convinced that if the Dow Jones performed well by the end of the week and his investments had risen, then he was going to have a good week and inside he would feel peace. But you know what? There's another week that comes when the Dow Jones doesn't perform well and it bottoms out. And you know what? You don't feel peace that week. And then two weeks later, it goes up and you feel peace. And then it goes down and you don't feel peace. Do you want to really peg your peace on your money, on your investments? Do you really believe that if you have enough money, God will be very pleased with you and you can give more and he'll forgive you? He'll give you a new life. 
He'll give you the promise and the hope of eternal life. For this man, what was missing is ultimately the step of surrender. And this man wasn't ready to take that step. The cost of that surrender was too deep for him, too steep. So the young man's, according to the Bible, his face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. I did a little research on this passage, this particular verse, and I wondered, what does that mean that your face fell? I kind of could picture it in my mind, but the actual Greek word means he went away, now listen to this, deeply grieved because the one thing that he needed to surrender is the one thing that he was not at all ready to give to Jesus. 13th century Italian poet and, and writer Dante calls this moment in biblical history the great refusal. A young man whose life is absolutely full of promise, chooses money over Jesus. Now, as the young man walked away, according to the word of God, Jesus looked around, and I'm sure that as I read this, he must have looked into the faces of his disciples who had a, well, now what are we gonna do kind of look. You know, they often had that look on them. Now what are we gonna do? You ruined another one. We could have had him. My goodness, if you would have not been so radical and just... Now what are we going to do? Jesus says this in verse 23. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now that statement amazed the disciples because you see, like good Jews, they have been taught that if God is pleased for you, then you're going to be wealthy. And if he's not pleased with you, then you're going to be dirt poor. And so, man, you know, Whoa, what are we doing here? This guy apparently has the favor of God resting on him. Jesus, he's rich. He's young. You know, he's got power. You realize Jesus. It's sort of a first century health and wealth gospel, a prosperity teaching that, listen, here's a sign of God. You've got money. You've got promotion. You're doing well. God must be pleased with you. Jesus, however, moves quickly to correct that kind of prosperity teaching. What he does, he repeats the earlier statement, and then he famously adds this statement. And everybody seems to know about this statement. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. There he goes again. We're talking about the rich young ruler, and suddenly there's a camel and a needle in the conversation. Jesus, what are you talking about? Now, this statement that you're seeing on the screen has been much debated in the church and among Bible scholars for years and years and years. And and some people will say to you, and and I'm not going to argue with them, that the camel relates to a a gate inside the the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And that may indeed be true, a, a small gate that a camel would have difficulty going through. But frankly, I don't want to read a whole lot into this passage, and and a lot of scholars won't. And so many people believe that this is simply Jesus exaggerating a point to make a point. And so what Jesus is saying here, listen, it's easier for a camel to go through, let me just contextualize this, your wife Jenny's needle. I don't use them, but I know where they are. And so I looked at one the other day. There is no way a camel gets through the eye of my wife's needle from her sewing basket. No way. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into the kingdom of God. Now, when you look at that, you say, whoa, I better get rid of my money because I don't want to be excluded from heaven. That is not what Jesus is saying. What he's saying is, if you have money, it's not going to get you there. It's not going to open the door to heaven. Having money, giving money, endowing things with your name on because you have money, those are good things, but they do not open the door to salvation and to heaven. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. 
No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and he will despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. But the disciples, they didn't get this. Mark tells us, if you have your Bibles, in verse 26, that they were even more amazed. And they said to each other, well, then who in the world can be saved? Who in the world can be saved if this rich young ruler who runs to Jesus, falls on his knees, says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? If he can't be saved because he has money, who in the world can be saved? Jesus answers with this reassuring word. With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Can you say that with me? With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. In other words, if you think you can please God and earn his salvation by what you have and what you do, you are attempting the absolute impossible in life. You cannot earn your salvation. You cannot do enough or pay enough for the God of heaven and earth to look at you and say, well, you reached the number that I've been looking for, 444 good works, you're on. You shoveled your neighbor's driveway yesterday in the midst of the bomb cyclone, as they called it, whatever in the world that means. And that was 444, you're in. Oh, I, I see what you give. I can even see the online. I know how you're using your money. You're in. It is impossible for man, men or women, impossible for us to earn our salvation, to gain his forgiveness, to be assured of a place in heaven. But... God can save anyone. His grace is sufficient for us. Rich or poor, good or bad, he can save anyone who's willing to take the one final step of surrender. Surrender to Jesus. Surrender to Jesus. Surrender to Jesus is what makes salvation possible. And that's the story of the rich young ruler. But hear me when I say this. It's not just his story. It's your story. And if it's not yet your story, the story of surrender, then it needs to be. For every one of us, there was a time when we were but one step away from a personal and eternal relationship with God. As you're sitting here this morning, and if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you are saved, I want you to think back. There was a time in your life before you were saved when there was one final step you needed to take in order to experience the forgiveness of sin and a new and eternal life in Christ. Now, some of you are sitting here and many of you are sitting here, and that final step was the step of surrendering your unbelief. You were living in a position of some doubts. You were not really believing that the things you were hearing were true. Maybe you were going to church, but as some people have said to Jenny and me just in recent months, you know, we're listening and we're thinking, really? Can you really know that you know that you know? I mean, is that even possible? And then you came to Christ. And you came to Christ because you took one final step. You surrendered your unbelief. You said, you know what? I'm not going to live in doubt anymore. If, if this is what God says, and this is what Jesus has done for me, you know what? I'm going to believe. 
I'm gonna believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you did. And in the words of, of a young guy who came to Christ last fall in our church, he said, man, Mike, he said, I sat there, I prayed to receive Christ. He said, immediately I felt like I was a new person. It's like the Holy Spirit came sitting right there in church. Well, yeah, that's what he does. Because you took one final step, surrender of unbelief. Some of us, and we don't have a slide for this, I added this at the last minute, some of us needed to surrender our attitudes. Because until someone invited us to church, we're going through life with this sour attitude about church. Yeah, I know about church, all they want is money. I'm not going to church, all they want to have their hands open, you know, and you know, all he preaches about is a rich young ruler and he has his hand in my pocket, but I'm not gonna go to church. There is a bunch of hypocrites. And, you, and, and, you, and the attitude had to be surrendered in order for you to meet Jesus. Give it up. Some people had to surrender religion. You're sitting here today and you grew up with a certain religious idea and you went through certain religious rituals. rituals. You practiced them, sometimes faithfully, sometimes not. But you did what you were told to do because in your religion, if you get baptized and then confirmed by age 12, and you join, you're in. The problem is you're not sure what you're in because you feel the same as you did before you were in. And there's no more peace with religion than without it. Now, I told this story, I can't remember how often I told this story, but it's a story worth telling. So I'm tell it again. If you didn't hear it, praise the Lord. If you did, keep listening. Some of you journeyed with Jenny and me in a journey of prayer for my Aunt Janet Giese to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus at the age of 96. And some of you remember that last year she came to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. But the deal with Aunt Janet who never had brothers and sisters, never had children, had a couple nieces, nephews, those are all 20 plus years older than me, and then there's me. We started caring for her in her older years. Now, she worked till she was 90 at Harley-Davidson, so she didn't need a lot of care. She was pretty independent, and she let you know that. But when she started to have declining health, we started to get really concerned as we had always been about her salvation. When she dies, where she's gonna go? Every single time Jenny or I would bring up the subject of the gospel, she would shut us down, refuse to even carry on a conversation. I mean, shut us down five words in. That was it. I said to Jenny one day, about a year and a half ago, I said, you know, I think the issue is religion because she was told and taught and was in a denomination and a local church that if you get baptized as an infant and then confirmed at the age of 12, you don't even have to come back to church if you don't want to. The important thing is cross the line of confirmation. And she crossed that line in a family that was very religious and that said, let's have a party, great, you're in, and never nurtured that faith. And so she thought she was good to go, but couldn't quite figure out why there was an emptiness in here, a lack of peace overall, and no assurance of salvation. So Good Friday 2021, we go to Pleasant View to visit her. And, and, and you have to yell to visit. So we're yelling, you know, and uh, talking, you know, and really loud. And... Um, and you have to do it through masks at that time. So that just made it all the more glorious and wonderful. And we're sharing, you know, about our lives. And then she says, so what are you going to do tonight? Well, we're going to Good Friday service. Well, of course you are. I figured you were. She was very, very forthright. And, um, and Jenny said, well, I'm teaching the children tonight. And without asking permission, 
Jenny began to teach Aunt Janet what she was going to teach the children. And for the first time, Aunt Janet didn't shut her down. And I was like smiling behind the mask, you know, like, oh my word, here we go. Bring it on, Jenny Sigmund, let's go. She maps out the entire gospel. At the end of which, Aunt Janet says, well, that sounds like what I learned when I was a child in Sunday school. I said, really? You learned that? Yes. I said, you know, Aunt Janet, and I shared the gospel more personally, and I said, you know, you need to confess your sin and repent of it, turn away from it, and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can be saved. And if you do that, Aunt Janet, with your own sincere heart, he will forgive your sin, he will give you a new life, and you can know that you know that you know that you will live forever with Jesus in heaven. Did you ever hear that, Aunt Janet? I listen to your CDs every week. Yes, I've heard it a whole lot. <laughs> I said, okay, good. It's called planting the seed. I said, Aunt Janet, let me ask you a question. Have you ever confessed your sin and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? And she said, I have not, just like that. And I said, would you like to do that today? Yes, I would. And with her own voice and words, she repented of her sin, surrendered her religion, and received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And three months later, she went to heaven. There was no indication on Good Friday that she was that close to heaven, but the Lord knew. The step of surrender was religion. I beg you, I beg you, if I could get back up real quick, I'd kneel down and beg you, I can't. So I beg you, if religion is keeping you from a relationship with Jesus, get rid of the religion. I beg you, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. There are other steps of surrender. For some people, it's the surrender of your need to please the people closest to you. The reason that you're not a Christian is because you're trying to please mother and dad, you're trying to please your husband or wife. I, 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 I tell you, you cannot live your life to please others. You need to live your life to please the Lord. Trust him. The surrender of your past. I can't tell you how many people have told me over the years, Pastor Mike, there is no way that God could ever forgive me. You have no idea what I did. You have no idea who I was. I, I love coming to church, but, but I just don't believe that there's any forgiveness for the accumulation of my past sin. And I wanna tell you something, I don't care how deep it has accumulated, he will wash it all away. If you will confess your sin and repent of your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, surrendering your past to him, just give it all to him. You don't need to inventory everything. Tell him everything that you can recall, everything that's on your heart, and let him forgive you and cleanse you. Now there are some of you here that your testimony is almost like a mirror reflection of the rich young ruler. Your issue was money. And it wasn't the fact that you had it, it's the fact that you loved it. And you loved it so much that it was the barrier that kept you from following Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus says, will you just surrender your love of money? and take the step to trust me. It may be that you are here today or online with us, and you have not yet taken a step of surrender. And you sit here week after week, and when Pastor Mike says what Pastor Mike says, do you know that you know that you know? You say, I don't think I've ever heard that before. But I could never admit 
My goodness, I've been in church for decades. I could never admit. Carolyn Zelensky in my church in Baltimore was 74 years old when she, in that church, walked down the aisle and prayed to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. I said, what kept you? She said, I was too embarrassed to admit that I had gone to church all those years and was trusting in my religion and didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And then I got to thinking, my goodness, who, who am I trying to please? I mean, I don't, I don't want to leave this earth and go to a Christless eternity in hell because of pride, because I didn't want to admit that I really didn't have a relationship and so I surrendered my embarrassment, and I just said, Jesus, I've been a good religious girl, but I want a relationship with you. I want you to forgive me and give me a new and eternal life. The story of the rich young ruler ends on a sobering note for the rich young ruler. He doesn't surrender to Jesus as far as we know. But your story doesn't need to end on a sobering note. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Do you know that you know that you know that your sins are forgiven and that you have a new and eternal life? Jesus never calls us to surrender to him without the assurance of a much greater reward. Peter is the one who punctuated this conversation by saying, well, we've left everything to follow you. Verse 28. And to answer Peter, Jesus takes his disciples then and now to the great event of history when he will come again to make the world perfectly new. At the death of every follower and in the second coming of Jesus Christ, Jesus promises that every person who has surrendered their lives to follow him will receive a hundred times as much and they will inherit eternal life. It's another way of saying it will be worth it all. It will be worth it all. Missionary at Ecuador and martyr for the faith, Jim Elliott, said it best when he wrote these words. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. What are you holding on to today? What have you yet to surrender so that you might fully follow Jesus? What one step must you take so that you know with absolute confidence that you are saved, that you have a new and eternal life in Jesus Christ. I invite you today, take that step of surrender. If the Holy Spirit has convicted you, and you know what it is, or to quote Aunt Janet, yes, I've heard you say it over and over again. Listening and hearing it is not the same as receiving it by receiving Jesus as Savior and Lord. Would you pray with me right now? Heads bowed and eyes closed. I believe that the work of God by the Holy Spirit of God is a work of conviction and it happens not only in the presence of the preaching of God's word, but it happens over the course of time. And that there are people online with us this morning and people here in this building who have been wrestling with the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the question, am I saved? Because man, I don't have peace. 
I, I can't say for sure that my sins are forgiven. I'm carrying around a whole load and I can't seem to get rid of it. And do I know that someday I will be in heaven? I want to. I want to. I really want to. But I can't say I know that for sure. The Word of God promises that if you're saved, you will. And so I invite you right now, here in this building and also online, where you can click raise a hand, if it is your desire to receive Jesus Christ and take the step of surrender this morning and give him whatever it is that's been holding you back from his gift of salvation, I invite you to raise your hand and in doing so say, Pastor Mike, I'm ready this morning to surrender and to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of my life. Are there any in this building who would take that step right now with an upraised hand and say, this morning is it. No more embarrassment, no more waiting, no more religion, no more holding back. This morning I'm going to pray and surrender and follow Jesus Christ. Are there any? I invite you to pray in this way. Jesus, I believe that you are the Savior and Lord. I believe that you died for my sins and I believe you are alive today. And I confess my sin to you and I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Jesus, please forgive and take away my sin. I believe that by the power of God you've been raised from the dead. Jesus, I want to follow you. I receive your gift of salvation. I confess you as Lord of my life. I surrender to you everything that's been keeping me from following you. In your own prayer, name that, whatever it is. Jesus, thank you for hearing my prayer and for saving me by your grace. In your name I pray. Lord, I thank you for those who have prayed that prayer here in this building and online. And I thank you for those who are here who long ago prayed that prayer, or maybe months ago, and who know now the assurance that comes from surrender. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this record of this encounter with the rich young ruler. Thank you for telling us about that so that we could understand how important surrender is. And thank you, Jesus, for looking at us and loving us. And we all pray this together in the strong name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen.